Thank you all uh, for coming. I just wanted to say hello and welcome um, to our panel about building a life in art. I'm Lizzie O'Leary, um, and I'm going to go down and just, do you guys want to say who you are? And then I have a little business to do beforehand before we get into it. So say who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Reed Lindsay. I'm a, a journalist and a documentary filmmaker. I'm Vicki Fang. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I'm Kai Collins. I'm an independent filmmaker and producer. I'm Tui Sutherland. I'm a children's book author. And I'm Veronica Roberts, and I'm director of the Cantor Arts Center at Stanford University. And welcome to all of you. Thank you guys so much for coming here. Um, I have two quick things I want to do. I want to thank the president of the college, Maude Mandel, who is right over here, and for whom we have a little present. It's very, very fancy. <laughs> Class of 98 t-shirt. <laughs> Williams, there you go. Yeah, more purple. Um, and our other little announcements are that right after this, we're going to have um, signings from Vicky and Tui, and they will be in the main stage lobby, just out the doors out that. Um, they're going to be able to sign three books initially, so if you have like stacks and stacks and stacks, pick the ones you most want signed. Um, then we are also going to have some books available for purchase from the bookstore in the lobby. And then in addition to that, there is a career meetup, um, the networking meetup. It's sort of out there and around um, in the EFs and transition kind of, I don't know, area. People are going to be talking, mentors, career coaches, all of that stuff. So that is also very exciting. Um, you guys have to pardon me a little bit because I have notes on my phone. So if I'm not like checking my email or doing something weird. That's so millennial of you. Like I feel like that's what the younger authors all do. They all read from yeah, their phones. Like, eh, I'm, just, I'm just like I'm doing some TikToks while we're here. <laughs> um, being in this building and thinking back on what it was like before it was this building and what we were like before we left this town, I am struck by how little I knew about creating a life path that was not investment banking or teaching English or being a doctor. And I knew I didn't want to do those three things, but I actually had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And we all emailed about this a little bit. I, I am kind of curious if there was a point when you thought, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to pick something maybe a little less traditional. And when that point occurred to you, like, was it at age one, Kai Collins? Or, <laughs> you know, was it being in one job, Vicky, and pivoting? And I, I, I wonder if you guys could talk a little bit about how you decided to do what you're doing with your life. And also, like, I want to encourage everyone to jump in and out and talk for a little while and, and just think about it. And we will, we will take questions at the end. So, um, I don't know. Kai, I, I, I feel like this is like in your bones from when you were a child. You can go first. Oh, since I, I, I knew what I wanted to do since birth. Um, <laughs> no, I, I just tried very, very hard to find something else I could do that wouldn't be so unpredictable and scary and uh, <laughs> So you, you chose making films. Well, I knew I always wanted, I mean, it was just in, innate, as we talked about a little bit, like I was, I had, at two years old, I had a harmonica and I would run around the airport and like entertain strangers. I was always commandeering like somebody's family's video camera and getting my brother, who bless him, he would play a bridesmaid, he would play anything, get up in a wig and a dress. Um, and cousins and neighbors, anyone who would like jump into my um, my productions. Um, so yes, it's always been something that I um, have done, but I never wanted to go the audition route. And even though I was always essentially writing and directing and producing from the time I was a youth, uh, the names of directors I knew were George and Stephen and James, and it never occurred to me that I could be a director. I thought, as a girl, I had to be an actress. And so, through a series of events, 
uh, I wound up in second, at Second City in Chicago and um, took a writing class and it was like the most, uh, it was the most alive feeling of power I ever had when we read my first script aloud in class and everyone was laughing so hard and I caught sight of this woman because um, our, our classroom was like glass walls and I caught sight of this woman and I was like, oh my God, she's so beautiful. And then I realized it was me laughing at all my classmates laughing at my script and it was just like, yes, this is, this is absolutely what I have to do and um, it's going to be really hard and it still is. And right now there's a writer's strike so everything is very up in the air for me, but um, shout out yeah, to the WTA. Just, WTA! WTA. <laughs> Um, Tui, you were working in publishing before you started writing, and am I right that you were not writing under your own name at first, right? Uh, I did a mix of my name and other, like I was, I just said yes to all the projects, and so they were like, let's only put your name on some of them, because <laughs> like, like, when we come to the bookstore with 10 Tui books, they might be like, let's take two, but if it's like, here's a Tui book and a Tamara Summers book, and a, you know, that it, it's a little easier. But yeah, Was no, it I scary to, to just sort of say like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm going to do it now? Um, well, I always, so to answer the first question, if that's okay, I, yeah. I always did want to be an author when I was a kid. I did a lot of... Um, like starting stories and then getting excited about a different one and going to start that story. And um, I read a lot of books about like biographies of authors and books about girls who wanted to be writers. You know, those were my, that's like, I feel like Anne of Green Gables is like embedded in my soul. <laughs> like I still reread it and I'm like, oh, was I like this way? Was I like this before I read this book or did this book make me this way? I'm not actually mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> um, but so, and then I think like high school and college, there was so much else happening. I don't think I did any creative writing while I was here because I tend, like a 10 page paper due every other day, it felt like. <laughs> so, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, just like work, but a lot of like opening my, mind up to other ideas and like you know so basically I feel like senior year senior spring especially I had zero time to think about what would happen afterwards I was like I'm getting I'm, I'm doing all the things now and so graduation happened and I went home and then I was like oh now what and after about like two weeks I was like well I can't stay here <laughs> because um, my mom is here. Um, so I got to go somewhere else. How about New Zealand? That's pretty far. So, <laughs> and that's where my mom is from. So it was like, um, I, I'm also a citizen. So I went over there and I could take some classes at the Auckland University. Um, and I took like a Mary art class and a children's literature class, um, which is something I wish they'd had here when I was here. Because it was like, it just made me think about that kind of writing and like why I loved it so much. Um, and it was also a great opportunity to take six months and just kind of think about what I wanted, like mm. which I had not had a chance to do while I was here. Um, and, it, and I kept thinking like, uh, it's writing, like I wanna do writing, but how do you get from, I wanna write a book to like, here's a book. Like what is, aren't there some steps, like <laughs> apart from just the writing, which is hard enough, but like then what? So when I got back, I applied for a job in publishing. Um, and I, I worked in a, in a children's publishing department. I started as an editorial assistant, and got all the way up to editor um, in first Penguin and then uh, HarperCollins. And it was so helpful because I was like, oh, this is how books happen. So you knew the, <laughs> the like inner machinery. Yeah. So I was like, um, yeah, yeah. So getting to see like how books submissions that come in, like what, like how, which submissions like stand out above the others and why. Well, there's a lot of, a lot of, especially editorial assistants, a lot of reading submissions and like weeding them out and giving the best ones to your boss, right? Um, and then as I got older, like reading those and then deciding like which ones can I pitch to the editorial team or whatever, and like how do I write a PNL to convince them we want this. Um, anyway, stuff that I'm glad I don't have to do anymore. <laughs> But I'm also glad I know about it because it helped with things like, why does it take so long? You know, like you send something into a publisher and you're like, tick, tick, tick. Like, why haven't they, why didn't they immediately write back to be like, best thing ever, I totally want it, right? <laughs> so um, it helped a lot with like patience and also um, like taking criticism, <laughs> a thing I was not good at when I was a kid. Um, so being the person to give the critiques as an editor and then like, huh. Getting like what made me better at listening to them and also like reading my own stuff. 
Um, and so, yeah, so I was in editing for a while before I felt confident enough. Like, I had written some books, like, while I was an editor. Um, and it was like, I had, like, a contract for enough books that I was like, I think I can do this. And then my dad flipped out. He was like, what? <laughs> you can't leave your secure job with health insurance and go write books? That's crazy. Why don't, he was like, why don't you go be an investment banker for just, like, 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> then and, like, make some money and save it up. I was like, dad, no. <laughs> That's really not happening. So, um, so I was like, nope, I'm jumping. I'm jumping off the, the safe boat and into the water and making some, just going to write books all day long and hang out with my dog. Um, and I'm so glad I did. <laughs> so Vicki, you pivoted kind of hard. <laughs> do you want to tell people what you're, like you were at Google. Were you thinking, I am, I am designing products for kids and now I want to what? Like go as analog as possible? Let me like take it back to the fundamentals. <laughs> that was part of it, yeah. Really? <laughs> uh, so, you know, talking about when did I know I wanted to go into creative fields, I always loved making stuff. Just my whole life, I liked making stuff. And so, um, you know, I think here being theater majors, uh, telling stories. <laughs> Yeah, we were strong. We were tight. I mean, <laughs> uh, but I just always liked creating things. And so I went, I became an actress for a while. Um, I became a game designer. I went to art school for design and technology. And then all of the tech companies started sucking up all of the designers. And wow, did they pay a lot of money. <laughs> and so I went to Google and I was designing things and I loved it. And I was designing products for kids and families. Um, so a lot of the products that I was making uh, were to help kids engage with technology, learn about coding, understand computational thinking. And around the same time, I was having kids of my own who are here in the audience. Hi, Tasso. Hi, Leo. <laughs> Um, and I was reading storybooks to them. Uh, and part of the thing when I was at Google, we were doing a lot of research work with kids and we learned, you know, a lot of the people that I worked with came from Sesame Workshop. Um, so understanding the importance of story and character and parasocial relationships and how much that can help education. So I was learning all of this stuff. I was having kids of my own. I was reading books with them and I thought, you know what? Everything at Google that I create has to involve machine learning and like this heavy computing, which is not accessible for all kids, um, having access to that technology. And I felt like I love this experience of sitting with my kid, and it is an interactive experience. You're reading together, you're turning pages, and as a designer, I wanted to design that experience. So I started writing books on the side um, while I was at Google, and at some point, between Google and writing books and raising my kids, I just felt like something I had to give, and it ended up being Google. Sorry, Google. <laughs> um, but I love writing books now, and now I've started illustrating as well, so I'm illustrating my own stuff. Um, and I think I've just always chased what I'm interested in, and that mm. has served me really well. Um, when you asked that question to us over email about, you know, when did you know? And I've sort of bounced all over the place, but I remember distinctly, I was interviewing for a job at Viacom when I was in my early 20s to be a producer at Viacom. And the woman who was interviewing me said, you know, you have this coding background and this creative background. If you went technical, it would be much more stable, like you know what that path looks like, you can do it. And she was trying to push me to go into engineering. And I said, no, I really, I want to do the creative. And looking back, I feel like that was a turning point where I could have gone either way. But I wouldn't have been a good engineer because I wasn't passionate about it. So I feel like that was really the right path for me. I, I mean, I have Veronica back clean up. So I'm going to read next. Um, you have spent a lot of your career, would it be fair to say most of your career, out of the US. Did, did you go in thinking, I, I'm here as a foreign correspondent, or did you think, I'm here m making film? Like, were you, did, did you set out to do one or the other? Um, well, I, it's, you know, it's interesting you were talking about the sort of maybe more traditional career paths from Williams, because I, I definitely had no idea senior year what I wanted to do and felt a lot of pressure to do something more traditional. Um, but I had, 
had had the opportunity to study abroad in Spain, which was really life changing for me. Uh, spring semester junior, I loved Spain. I I thought I was terrible at languages, but I realized I could learn Spanish, and I just was fascinated by, with the idea of living outside of the U.S. But it's sort of hard just getting a job right out of college, and I had no nothing on the resume, and so I. Uh, I ended up teaching English as a foreign language in Argentina just because I wanted to be outside of the U.S., but with no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and while I was in Argentina, it was a lot of tumult it was a somewhat tumultuous time politically. And there were, I would be teaching English and there'd be protests happening outside, uh, you know, marches by, you know, you could, uh, by, uh, from the, you could see them from the window of the classroom. And I started getting really intrigued by the politics. And I also happened to take a class in, um, in, at the law school there, and, uh, and the professor was like really uh, fiery leftist <laughs> uh, law professor, and I was I got really engaged in the political situation there and interested in it, and so I thought, wow, this is um, that that sort of uh, this, I would love to l write about this and like I want to tell this it. story. Yeah, I don't even know if I wanted to tell a story. I ended up going back to the U.S. and getting a uh, doing an internship at a think tank, which did a lot of work on Latin America, where I was writing press releases for journalists to try to get them to understand certain issues there. And then I realized, well, what if I could be one of those journalists? Then that would be great. And so then I tried to figure out, well, how do I do that? And I, it was not, it's not the clearest career path to get there. The more traditional one is I asked a lot of career journalists, and they said, well, you know, get a job at AP for a few years, and then you maybe get a job at the New York Times, maybe 15, 20 years, they'll, you'll, get a, you'll get posted somewhere. And I, that, I didn't really want to wait that long, so I just, I found a job at a, a, a newspaper in Mexico called the Mexico City News. It was an English language newspaper, but pretty much anyone could get a job there because they paid almost no money, and uh, they just needed someone who could speak English and write in English and didn't require any experience. So I went there, and I sort of <laughs> cut my teeth there as a journalist, and then, um, and I loved it, so I sort of went from there. But you know, I was thinking about creating a life in art because I always consider myself the least artistic and creative. Person. Well, that's kind of what I wanted to ask you: is like, do you consider yourself a, a, an artistic person? You are, in fact, making films. I mean, Belly well, of the Beast is beautiful. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, you know, for a long time, I, I absolutely did not consider myself uh, what I did art or or creative at all. I used to write. I, initially, I wrote articles. And then ended up doing a little radio, and then uh, television news, which is it's hard sometimes, you know, TV news to consider that very artistic. But I, 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 when I started doing documentaries, you know, you span out. It, it's essentially storytelling. It's storytelling, and then, and when you're telling a story, um, there's a lot of subjectivity that goes into it. There's there is a lot of creativity that goes into it, especially with video. I think. Um, and, uh, and so I realized that there was actually a, a really strong creative element. And what always drove me in my, to do what I did as a journalist was trying to make an impact and try to expose injustices. And that, that's, that, that's what most motivated me. But if you can, you know, in time I realized if you can, the more compelling and powerful story that you can tell, the, the, you know, potentially the greater impact you can have. And so, and, and there's definitely, and you need to, and there's definitely creativity that, it, that, that is required to, to do that in an effective way. The reason I wanted to come to Veronica last was because when we were all on Zoom and talking about this stuff, you, you sort of said like, oh, well, maybe, maybe my path was more traditional, that at Williams there was a, a set of examples of how to move through the museum world. And, and how to see that kind of spread out in a, in a more linear way in front of you. And I, I wonder if it felt that way to you or if you felt like you were taking a leap. Well, I will say, I think Williams College might be the only college where like the path of museum curator seems like totally logical. <laughs> and, and you're like, oh yeah. Um, so, but what I will say is I never ever imagined I'd be a museum director. If any of you know me, my hair's always wet. I'm usually a little late to class. So um, nothing like has changed about any of that. But, um, but I fell in love with art history in 101, 102, and I was like, this is it. Like, I've got to do something in art history. And um, yeah, and I, what was wonderful, I started interning at museums. 
I was a guide at the Williams College Museum, and that was really foundational, because growing up in a major city, I loved museums. My grandmother took me to museums. I went to museums. But you don't feel like they're your own. You don't feel like, I definitely didn't imagine as a high school student that I would ever be working in one. But at Williams College, I absolutely felt like it was my own museum. I worked there, I gave tours, I loved it. Um, so it's, it started to feel like an interesting career path. And then I started interning in the summer, and I think I was, um, I applied to intern at the Baltimore Museum, and I, d I remember my CV was two pages, and I don't know how that, they said that they accepted me in spite of it, because um, I had like one job prior to that, so I'm really not sure what I wrote there, but, um, and I, so I interned at the Baltimore Museum, loved that, and then interned at the Whitney when I graduated, like there was no, you don't get a job at a museum on like a curatorial path at a particular time, there's not like, it's not like the consulting track where you like do the, so I just took an internship after I graduated, and I remember all I got was, it was at the Whitney, I was in the education department, and all we got was an, un, we got an unlimited Metro card, and doesn't get you that far. Um, and thankfully Graham, I don't know if he's in the room, but Graham Dresden was gonna be working in an emergency room in Oakland, and my mom adored Graham and said he could live with her, for, you know, because he was making no money. And then his parents felt kind of guilty that he was being housed and fed, so they offered for me to live in their beautiful Riverside Drive apartment. It all went downhill from there. But, um, so I was lucky enough to have, you know, I didn't, I'd never lived in New York, I'd only been to New York once in my life. And, um, and I interned at the Whitney, and I had amazing mentors. I had, um, and I just, and writing was really central to what I was doing, so even though I was in the education department, I was getting to do writing labels, and I just had really incredible mentors, and I, um, I saw a path at that point. So it does feel a little bit more linear, although I definitely never imagined that I would be exactly here. Um, so I, w I want to ask a question. I kind of want to kick this around with you guys a little bit um, about balancing responsibility and creativity, especially those of you who have things aimed at younger audiences. And Veronica, I think this also applies to you. I know you've actually spent a lot of time championing the work of women artists, artists of color. How, how do you, when you are thinking about your work, Tui, we'll start with you. Where are you saying, like, this is a storyline, this is where I want to go, but also a 10-year-old girl is reading this and I, I want her to feel courageous and empowered and, and take something, you know, really full and exciting away from my work. Yeah, I, I mean, I think about that a lot. Um, uh, and I think that that's something that has evolved, like, in my work over time. Like, I, I was thinking about this recently because I talked to um, a high school class on, like, writing for change. Um, and it made me kind of go back and think through, like, sort of my progress and how when I started, um, the, a lot of the books I wrote were very much like, I just want kids to love reading. And if that's all I accomplish in my life, with, like, uh, that's awesome, like, <laughs> check. Um, that would be great. Um, because I think that's the beginning. Like, if, if they read something of mine and then they go on to read um, the books that I feel like will change the world, like um, the front desk or the hate you give, like, I, then, I, then I'm like, that's awesome. Um, and then, but I, I feel like with the Wings of Fire series especially, like, I do try to think about you know, the themes. I, I hate the word themes. <laughs> like, I, always, I always feel like in high school, I was like, ugh, themes. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I felt like my English teacher was making them all up. Like, like they was just interpreting, like, what, like, I was like, I could, I could put any theme in this book. But um, with Wings of Fire, I guess I do. I have, like, a, at the beginning of each arc, I have, like, a, an overarching um, sort of thing that I'm thinking about for the series. So, like, with the first five books, it was um, fate versus free will and the idea of, like, choosing your destiny. Like, I wanted kids to read it and come out of it feeling like, you know, even if I am in a prophecy that says I'm one of the dragons that has to save the world, like, I still get to choose how I do that. Like, I'm the person in charge of what happens to me. Um, and the last five that I've just finished were about, like, empathy versus, like, resistance to evil because I was thinking a lot about um, what do you do when you're someone who just wants to like understand and like sympathize but then you're confronted with like a world where people are just doing bad things like I was having some feelings <laughs> 
was I was in a, a mood. Really about what? Like what was going years. on? <laughs> um, so where I was like, okay, so what do I do about this? I just want to hug everybody, but like some of these people are bad, and hugs won't fix them. And um, I like, so can I write about some dragons? They're having those same feelings, and like you know, and because it's a different character in each book, I also get to come at it from different directions. So I have my like very huggable dragon, but then I have the dragon in book 13 who's like, let's set it all on fire. <laughs> so I can work through those feelings too, because I also have those feelings. So, um, so I'm always thinking about that. Like, what is? Um, I try to start with the characters. So, like, um, I feel like the plot. I want it to be really fun. I want kids to really love reading them and just like enjoy it. But I'm hope. But like, the, for me, it starts with like, where? What are the characters? Like, how are they? all related to this thing that I'm thinking about and like wh how do they change over the course of the book and they don't all come to the same answer because I don't think that would make sense <laughs> um, but they're all working although they're all thinking about the same things I'm thinking about and I'm hoping it makes kids talk to their parents about it and I'm hoping it sparks conversations um, and makes them think about what you know what kind of dragon do I want to be <laughs> so I don't know if that answers the question yeah. but that's, that's Vicky do you think about this yeah, I do. I write for a younger audience than Tui, um, but coming from Google, a lot of my stuff was trying to introduce the STEM concepts to kids. So I wanted to introduce computational thinking and design thinking, um, technology, code. Uh, but again, I wanted it to be really fun. So, you know, my books are often based with fantastical premises. So like the first Layla and the Bots book, they're doing, they're doing the whole design cycle, but they're designing an amusement park for dogs, you know? So I'm trying to make it fun and accessible. And then it's also something where, you know, I want to introduce these concepts, but I'm not trying to turn every kid into an engineer. It's really about problem solving um, and being computer literate, understanding how the technology in our world works, but being able to break down a problem and, um, you know, think through it logically. So a lot of it is about problem solving and logic, and it, a lot of it happens to involve technology. Um, now, you know, I'm getting into my, I just accepted my 20th book contract. Um, I'm moving into, you know, SEL things, um, social emotional learning, and um, different topics as I watch my kids grow up, and I think about the things that are important to them and the things that they're grappling with as they go through friendships and school. So um, I'm always trying to think about something that's going to be relevant to kids, but make it fun. <laughs> yeah, and I love that Layla and the bots like work together too. It's like, let's all brainstorm and then bring our ideas back together. And, and so it always feels like a group project and we're like all working on it together. I love that so much. Yeah, it's, it's very much based on the, the Google structure set. <laughs> There's like a product manager, there's an engineer, there's a mechanical engineer and a researcher and a coder and they, they have to collaborate. <laughs> uh, but that's actually how it works and that's actually something I miss about product design is that collaboration because writing can be, you know, well, Vicky, what do you want to do next, Vicky? <laughs> you know? With your dog, me and my dogs, we're just like, yep, in the middle of the night. I want to have a t-shirt made that reads, is this only funny to me? <laughs> Because I write comedy, I'm like cracking up, but. <laughs> okay, but that's not true because I have watched your work and it is like deeply empathetic. Well, thank you. I mean, it's funny. Like Cannabis Moms Club is really funny. Thank you. But you, there's also like sadness and kind of well, the I full range of, of, you know, humans finding. All of my writing you know, comes out of mostly autobiographical experiences and for as long as I can remember I've had a simultaneous track running in my brain we're like this is awful like I am I am grieving I am traumatized this is horrible how could I make this into a funny story and so I'm simultaneously experiencing something really painful but there's some sort of survival mechanism that kicks in that uh, forces me to take a step back and like see it through a comedic lens um, and and that's been my lifesaver because I, I don't know if you guys have found since we graduated from Williams like things are kind of hard <laughs> like life can be painful um, and throw you for some loops and so yeah that's my goal is just if as long as I can laugh and keep laughing then then I know I'm gonna be okay Veronica and, and Reed like you both in slightly different ways are responsible for carrying other people's story, championing other people's work or experiences. How do you think through 
kind of what you, I'm going to start with you, like what you want to showcase. And, and, and I'm also curious, like whether you have re found resistance in that, like when you, when you are, want to champion someone's work. Um, that's a great question. That is one of my favorite parts of my job is championing other people's work. And, um, and I would say the, and it's great to be a director because you get to decide as director exact, I don't have to ask anyone anymore. So that's really easy and wonderful now. But, um, but for the last 10 years, I was a curator in Austin, Texas, and it was such an interesting landscape to work in. And, um, I, it was a, a museum that had, um, when I arrived, it felt a little bit discombobulated. It had had some ups and downs and some turbulence. And so what was great is there was an entire team. It wasn't just me as a curator, it was an educator. It was um, a bunch of us all starting, all in it together. And I really thought a lot about the kind of voices I wanted to champion. And, um, and I remember there was this one artist, Vincent Valdez, who I'm very close to and had an amazing experience working with, and his work was dealing with white supremacy before we were really talking about, like there was this amazing painting of the Ku Klux Klan on a, on a, a bluff, and he was talking about, this was before um, Charlottesville, this was before Trump was elected, and it was like, he was like a really, you know, fringe candidate, and, um, and he made this extraordinary painting that I thought was sort of a clarion call. And I told my director, I was like, oh, I, we already had his work in the collection. We were already, he was a Texas artist. We were already completely committed to him. His work was always dealing with societal troubles. And, um, but I put it on the calendar and then like Charlottesville happened and like all this stuff happened and suddenly it was like, just a completely different landscape. And it was a really stressful situation because we felt like we needed to contextualize it entirely differently and, um, and think about how we were presenting this work to a larger audience. It was a very different moment. And um, what I really appreciated was my boss at the time uh, really was like, she's like, are you ready for this? Like, do you, do you believe enough in this artist? Because this is gonna be like all hands on deck. This is, we're all gonna be, you know, focused on this, and you're, it's gonna take incredible resources and thought and care. I think we rewrote the press release like a hundred times. I rewrote the labels a hundred. I mean, it was just, there were so many different conversations. We had to meet with faculty, we met with, we also had um, someone who we thought was gonna maybe bring a knife or a gun to the lecture, and we all had to be like prepared for, we had a safety plan in case somebody came with a knife or a gun to the talk. I mean, it was just like a very different level of what I'm used to. And um, thankfully, no violence occurred, and um, we got a really snarky review in the New York Times about how we were like over planned the show and were too defensive, but that ended up bringing in the public. It was like the greatest thing that could have happened. But um, I learned bad press is good press. But um, so, and it was just this incredible moment too because we had these comment cards and I think like 800 people filled out comment cards where they were saying like, this, this work spoke to me so much, and um, also just so much, I could see the impact it had on the community, also because there were so few, in Texas, there were so few Latino artists whose work was ever on view, so many people would come into the museum and also say, I've never seen, who were Latina, Latinx, and say, I'd never seen a name that looks remotely like mine, and we're talking about Texas, which is, you know, that shouldn't be the case. Um, and so, the, but also just seeing the staff and seeing how supported and how everyone came together and felt a sense of pride about this experience and it and it wasn't without stress it wasn't without trauma it wasn't without anxiety and that was just incredibly empowering to have that to to just be able to share that work that was meaningful um, it opened so many conversations we had so many community conversations around it um, so it was so much more than just the artwork right uh, and it taught me so much and I'm just so glad that the museum was brave and that it that they saw that we all got to experience not just you know a, gu a gun or a knife in a you know <laughs> lecture hall which would have been really scary but um that we got to see the way the community responded and how um and how the staff came together around that so that was very powerful that was in like maybe 2015 or how long ago it was a while ago but it was a really foundational experience for me Reed, how do you think about carrying other people's stories because you're, you're doing it from a perspective of like 
you're kind of an outsider, and yet you've been working in Latin America for so long, you're, you're, you're not anymore. Like, how, how does that responsibility sit with you when you're working? Well, it's a, uh, something I've struggled a lot with um, because, um, and, and then I, it's taken me many years, I think, to start to realize a lot of things about that because I feel like being a journalist, especially being a white man, a journalist from a rich country, going to the global south, and uh, it's like, um, it's, it's very problematic, frankly, and it's also like inherently exploitive and like it's almost like extractive and people know that i i really started to understand this better in haiti because uh you know you go in, in haiti you you feel it's just anywhere you look extreme poverty and suffering and tragedy and, and you, you're filming people and inter interviewing them and and sometimes people react very hostily to you because they're like what are you going to do for me why should i talk to you because they know that they're being exploited because in a sense, you, you're exploiting them. Mm. I interview that person, and I could say, you know, journalists like to think, oh, well, I'm telling their story, and then that's a good thing, and it's good for their country and for them in the long, you know. No, <laughs> maybe, probably not. And, and so, but I'm benefiting, because then I'll file my story, and I'll get paid, and I'll make a living, or whatever, right? But they're not getting anything out of it. I even had experience with uh, working with foreign journalists. One time, this channel in England that I was working for, and they came down, and afterward, the journalists wanted to give money to these poor people who had been lost their home through this violence and conflict. And the, the, the producers back in the UK, UK did not want them to give them a penny because it was like unethical to do that. And um, so anyway, I find it very, I, I, I've, so <laughs> I've struggled a lot with this issue, and, and uh, I've been a parachute, what I call a parachute journalist. You don't see, uh, um, you know, journalists from the global south coming here to report on all the problems in this country. It's the other way around. And so I've been, with the project that I have now called Belly of the Beast, it's a media outlet and we're aimed at a U.S. audience, but I'm trying to, um, to uh, sort of do the opposite of parachute journalism as much as possible and working with Cuban journalists and filmmakers and put, send, <laughs> in a collaborative way so that they're centered and they're, they're the ones telling the stories about their own country. And I actually just had a really amazing experience where this, the presenter and star of our, of our series called The War in Cuba, Liz Oliva Fernandez, she was just in the US. So I felt like let's turn parachute journalism on its head and she can come to the US and report on what's happening here. But she's not reporting on the problems in this country, she's reporting on how this country affects her country. Mm. So it, it uh, but I, even still, like I still, it's something that I I constantly um, struggle with because I feel like there is this inherently ex exploitive uh, aspect of 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 me as a you know being from here and, and being in a country like Cuba or wherever it may be in the global south. And I, that's something that, unfortunately, I don't think it really gets talked enough about in the world of journalism and documentary filmmaking. I think it really there needs to be more more discussion about about that. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, I, certainly in terms of, I mean, this is not about the economics of the news business, but in the shrinking economics of the news business, it, it does mean that, like, you go someplace for two days and that's all you get. And it's a very reductive view of wherever, wherever you are and whatever you get to do. Um, but one more question for you, Reed, because I think that your work, I feel like, has shifted a little bit in that the, the, maybe the point of view that you are working from now is... I don't know, do you feel like it's, it has a different lens on the US now? Like, particularly thinking about US Cuban, US, US Cuba policy, that, that you're coming from a slightly different place than a parachute journalist. Yeah, um, well I think, you know, one thing that I'm, so I started, the, we started this media outlet called Belly the Beast, um, and, and we cover US Cuba relations, and, and I'm really proud of some of the things that we've accomplished, some of the videos and documentaries. But I have to say, like, what I'm most proud of is the the collaborative nature of the, hmm. which no one sees, but I get to see it, uh, because um, it's, uh, it, I, I'm seeing through, I have my perspective, and, but the Cubans have a very different perspective who are on the team, 
and we have a sort of, and we sometimes face really tricky issues that are extremely complicated. How do you tell the story? How do we, in a truthful way, but that the, the understanding that the audience in the U.S. doesn't maybe understand this at all. So how do we get at this issue in a way that's not going to sort of uh, reinforce this, you know, the same old narrative about uh, Cuba and co communist-run country and so on and so forth, and, and, and yet at the same time not stray from, you know, be, be true and, and, and tell things how they are. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that process of, like, not working alone, but working in a collaborative environment where I'm coming from the perspective of being from the U.S., and then, but then I'm working with colleagues who are in Cuba and have the very different perspective and totally different experience has helped sort of change that, uh, that, that lens of, of how to tell a story. So I sort of have a question about um, America um, because I am interested in whether you all think that the American mindset builds in time for creativity and art and like just li listening to you, for example, Tui, talking about having to have like the, the, make the space in your brain to be able to think. I, my husband is a theater director. I traveled with him to Switzerland when he was directing a show there and we were working with the state theater where like the actors are all on salary and they're just, they're actors and then they get health insurance and they do all this stuff and coming and then coming back and seeing, <laughs> seeing how it works in New York is very different. And so I'm, I'm curious whether you all think that is something where the U.S. places a value, doesn't place a value, you know, how you find that value. Kai, I kind of want to start with you because you've had, you've had to like make your own work and make other people's work for like how, do you feel like there is room for that kind of life? I, uh, well, as you were speaking, I immediately thought of the pandemic and how um, during lockdown, we were all binging shows. We were just, you know, whether it was Tiger King and we're having like Zooms about it or uh, whatever it was that you watched, any sort of films or shows, reality, whatever it was that got you through the pandemic, all of the art that kept you going. Um, I don't think anyone really could have gotten through the pandemic mm. mentally intact without, without film and, and television and music and, and art. And so the crazy thing to me was everyone, from my perspective, was surviving this pandemic on the backs of artists, whereas every artist I knew, even people who've had like Netflix and Amazon specials, are selling their furniture, they're offering to teach yoga classes. Someone who just had a smash like comedy special on Netflix was like, does anyone need a babysitter? And so it was such a disconnect for me to be an artist struggling during the pandemic and seeing how everyone else was just like surviving off our work, off our backs. Mm. And we're not getting, um, you know, we're. So the fact, like the concept of being, getting a salary for an, uh, to be an artist just because is, uh, where can I move to do <laughs> so, that? I mean, Switzerland, apparently, you can move to Basel. It's very nice, um, cold. But yeah, that's something that, that really resonated with me during the pandemic, like how much everyone was relying on, um, on, on Netflix and television and, and all of those artistic mediums that um, were not being compensated fairly for, so. I, at all. I totally agree that, that in this country, I think about it all the time with visual artists and everyone wants their kid to be an artist, but no one wants their kid to grow up to be an artist. Like no one. Every artist I ever hear give a talk says like my parents really didn't want me to be an artist. They want you to be a doctor. You know, so I mean, what does that mean? That means that they're worried about your economic survival. But I do think that things have changed, uh, are changing um, slightly, uh, you know, underneath our feet. And um, in museums, there's been a lot more attention being paid to, you know, it's not a privilege to show at a museum. It's a lot of work. So how do we compensate artists for being in exhibitions now? Do you guys still have unpaid interns? Would absolutely not. Are you kidding? No way. At Stanford, that would be, no, absolutely not. I don't know how long ago they would have gotten rid of that. But yeah, no, no unpaid internships whatsoever. But but more importantly, also paying artists for their time, their labor, so they're now, you know, um, I'm doing a show called Day Jobs, which is very connected to this topic, and it's about artists whose day jobs as, whether it's a lawyer or a janitor or a, um, 
you know, uh, whatever the, the, the job may be, how that is infiltrated into their practices. And I was sort of interested in exploring that because it's a very American phenomenon to have to have at least one day job, maybe two. Um, but we're gonna be paying every artist who's in that show a fee for just having their work in the show, even though we're not commissioning new work. It's not like we're asking you to give us a screenplay or a new work, but just a fee because there is labor involved in making work. And I think that, we're trying to figure, but in other countries, in Canada, in Europe, it's it's so different, and there's government support for the arts, so it is it is an uphill battle. But but I do think um, compensation is changing, and and that we have to be drivers, and hopefully the Writers Guild will succeed. You know, these are the key battles that are being you know fought right now, um, and you know, and also in terms of like healthcare and all of those things that are so essential. So yeah, I think we have a long ways to go, but I'm encouraged that we are starting to make those changes because it, it's connected also to diversity and equity and inclusion. Like who can do these jobs? Yeah. You know, we have a class, there's a classmate from Williams, Ingru Chen, who's a friend of mine a couple years behind us, and we both got unpaid internships at the same time, and she didn't take hers, and I took mine, and lived with someone else's parents, but, um, and she didn't take hers and got another job and extent and waited a year, because it was at Sotheby's, I think, and she couldn't afford an unpaid internship. And now she has a, a gallery in Brookline, Massachusetts called Praise Shadows, and she has a paid internship for local high school students. They all get paid, and it's this amazing program. So she's changing that landscape, and that's what we all have to do. That's what this generation has to do, and the next generation, because we've got to fix it. Because these are awesome careers. Yeah, I would shout out, um, we need diverse books, that organization as well, because they are doing a lot in this area in terms of trying to like, create support for um, other voices to come in and work in publishing or be published. Uh, and I just think that um, it's, it is really important and um, amazing. And I, I agree, I hope that the WGA strike like, makes a big difference, because I think also in like, um, if, if all the hot people strike, it'll make a difference. <laughs> like if the actors strike, and it's like, yeah, you got a bunch of writers on a picket line, fine. But then you're like, whoa, those people are on the picket line. Yeah, <laughs> Hollywood cares. Then maybe they'll listen. Yeah, um, but it's it's really interesting to see like the just the stories coming out. Like I feel like I knew some of it from um, like uh, the. Work to Wings of Fire's maybe TV show route. I think that was happening, um, but I didn't know everything. And like, so learning about like what a mini writer's room is and why it's not great, and like how we and how it used to be in TV and how it is now and how hard it is to be a TV writer and like sustain a career. I think it's um I think just making it more visible so that people know and then hopefully like changing it. Um, and yeah, I, I agree. I think this is a really important time for that. I feel like too, in addition to the economics of it, which are so hard in this country, I mean, healthcare alone, I think is a huge hurdle for people too, so. Childcare. Um, <laughs> but I think there's also just the, the productivity mindset that affects all of us in this country, um, where you're expected to be creating output at all times. And there's, I think, not enough value placed on uh, quiet time thinking you know just like the yeah the space needed to create things and do positive good you know I think there's time that needs to be taken um, for everyone not just artists and I think we're in a mindset especially you know with constant connectivity and constant you know productivity that I would love to see shift well, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I've, I've been thinking about this a lot, the difference between the time you spend um, like working for a long time on something quietly by yourself versus like the, the mindset now, which is like, I have to post something every day. I'm creating free content so that people will come see my other stuff. And it's like, well, shouldn't you, like, I want them to have the time to spend on the actual stuff, you know? I, um, and my, my teenager and I are having really interesting conversations about this now. Like what is more like effective, like what, um, whether it is important, those like 30 second videos, because I think you can make a difference with those, but, um, but I'm like, but don't you want to spend a year writing a book instead? <laughs> I mean, he's not on social media yet, he's not allowed. I, 20 more years, maybe. <laughs> Similar, similarly, I've had so many people tell me like, why don't you make reels? Why don't you do TikTok videos? Why aren't you always, I'm like, because I'm making actual movies. Mm -hmm. 
Like, I don't have time for this social media stuff. And you don't feel the pressure to do it, or do you feel the What's pressure? that? Do you feel the pressure to do that stuff? I did initially, but, um, you know, it's really interesting in Hollywood, because they're very lazy, which you can see from the number of, like, remakes and, like, how many, you know, shows are we going to see time and time again. Some of them are great. Most of them are not. But... Um, so there's now a, a situation in, in Hollywood where they don't want to do any work. So rather than seeking out talent that's exciting and, and new and different and fresh voices, they're looking for people who have over 10,000 followers on Instagram or TikTok. And they are then plugging those people into projects because they don't have to do any work publicity-wise because these people are already generating their own fan bases. And so it's, a, it's really deteriorating um, you know, just the quality of, of art and what we consider art. And I've been having a lot of conversations with this writer's strike because uh, I don't know if anyone read this very interesting article in the New York Times about how the last writer's strike actually gave rise to Trump's presidency. Uh, the writer's strike, uh, when I first, first year I moved to LA was uh, November of 2007 and nothing was in production. And so then there was a glut of reality television that was released, including three months after the strike, a show called The Apprentice. And so um, it's just a very interesting time when, like I said before, where I felt like none of us could have survived pandemic without the arts. Um, and yet artists are becoming more and more marginalized and, and, and it's, it's, yeah, it's an ongoing battle. We have about 15 minutes left, and I do want to take some questions, but I actually want to ask you guys just to and jump in whenever. Like, where, where do you find inspiration, or how do you find inspiration? If you're feeling stuck, if you feel like, I don't really have a good idea, like, what, do you, what do you do? I've always been a fabulous eavesdropper. <laughs> That's and uh, yeah, so much of my work is just like, I'll be writing, and I'll suddenly think of something that happened in seventh grade with my like home ec teacher. And I'm like, oh, Mrs. Roshelo would be perfect as this kind of character. So I'm just always integrating like life experiences and that's where I get it. From travel, you guys. Travel so and getting out watching. of the routine, I would say. Like getting out of my day-to-day -day routine and being away from the office, travel, any, and preferably involving beaches. I'm sorry, I have to go on a trip now to a beach to like, so you just like put that in your new job contract? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, being around my kids a little bit, um, I mean, like you said, Vicki, um, and then just like, what, <laughs> what am I feeling <laughs> today? How do I like grapple with it by making my dragons deal with something like that? Like, <laughs> you know, how can I turn this into a dragon story? Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm working on something new now, actually, that's not Wings of Fire. Um, and so the inspiration comes from two different directions. One is like, what, like I was, I read constantly and I'm so I was like flipping and I was like what are the things that make me always want to pick up a book like can I put can I take those three elements mm -hmm. that always get me excited and put them together in a book and then so that's one direction so that'll be the fun part and then like why why am I writing this book like what is meaningful about it and it's the it's like this question of like authenticity versus like branding and like your platform and like who are you to everybody else and who are you really to yourself and with your friends and, and who's who are you the most real with and mm -hmm social media and reality TV, it's, there's a lot going on. My editor's like, oh my God, do we okay? <laughs> sure, then can we have more Wings of Fire? And I was like, all right. <laughs> so so I'm, at the, I'm at the like inspiration stage. We'll see what happens, whether I can pull it all together. You can pull it all together. <laughs> I think like to, I also, I consume a lot of art. That's how I get my inspiration, any type of art, because I feel like consuming art helps me feel something. And then that feeling I can tap into and explode into a creative project. So uh, that's what I do when I get stuck. Wait, can I jump, sorry, sorry, <laughs> one more thing. Yeah, I often had a deadline where I was like, I had a month to write the book and it happened to coincide with a Game of Thrones season. And so I would be like, what are they doing wrong and how can I do it better? So like, that was <laughs> 
<laughs> like <laughs> there was like one where it's like someone got murdered and I was like, I know who did it and I know their whole motivation. And then I was wrong. It wasn't with that. And I was like, well, then I'm going to write that story because I like it better. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, no, I totally like thinking about how people write stories and like how I want to approach the same concepts. What Tui just said reminded me of an exercise I used to do when I was in Chicago, um, going to Second City. That was where I first started like writing officially, I suppose. Um, and I would put, I have a huge record collection, and I would put a record on, and I would make myself write a scene for each song on, on the record, or at least come up with, so it was essentially as if like, this album is the soundtrack to a film. What is this film about? Um, so I, I sometimes still go back to that. But usually it's just, yeah, personal experiences. I'm like, uh, I gotta find a way to laugh about this. <laughs> How about you? Um, I like to, uh, even, I'm, even though I'm doing documentary, I actually often find more inspiration when watching fiction. Really? Just creatively, yeah, and seeing if, oh, can we do this? How do, can we do this in a, do something creative to tell, tell this real story? You know, I think I, I like to get, get, get inspired with fiction, maybe more than, maybe I get bored, but I don't like to watch documentary. <laughs> <laughs> it's too boring. It's too much reality. Um, so I want to see if we can take a couple of questions. Beth, are we doing mics, or should people just shout them out? Um, probably mics, I think, would be easiest. <coughs> um, and when you guys hear a question, um, if I could have you guys take the question back, sure. so everyone can hear the question. Yeah. So maybe I'm not running along with Mike. Maybe we'll have questions come from the audience. And then I can repeat them. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys have any questions? You can general way. Yeah, what's your question? You in the, in the William shirt right there. This is a question for Dewey. How long did it take to write the, all 17 books of the Wings of Fire series? How long did it take for Tui to write all 17 books of the Wings of Fire series? I actually know exactly because um, I turned in the outline for the first five, which was very vague, um, about like a day before my first kid was born, and he's 13 now. So I've been working on them that long. I mean, the first one didn't come out until a couple of years later. Like, you know, it takes a while to get it all done. But I was writing them, like, as he was growing up. So, yeah, it's been 13 years that I've been working on this. <laughs> yep, right here. How do you start writing? To, to, to everybody or to Tui or to Vicky? I started writing, uh, I started keeping a journal. Um, I would just write down, sometimes it was just a, a pithy thought I thought should be put down for the record. <laughs> Um, and so actually my, my journals are largely like all about my Williams time here and like anecdotes about, about things. And then, and then eventually I started finding s connections and ways in which these disparate events and funny incidents like could weave together into one story. But I would say just write every day, make it a practice, um, spend 20 minutes where you just write and you can write about anything. It doesn't have to be good, just write it. And then, uh, you know, for me, so much of, of, of the quality is in the rewrite. Hmm. So don't, don't, don't second guess every other word. Don't, don't be, be uh, so um, hard on yourself in terms of just getting something on the page. Just start writing. And if you make it a practice, it will just be something that comes naturally. Yeah, I, I like to say it's like playing an instrument. Like, if you keep doing it, like, it gets easier. Like, it gets smoother. It's a muscle that if you really work your craft. <laughs> um, I, I did the same thing. I had a little notebook that I, I, that I would carry around and just write, like, on the subway. It was yeah. a really good time for I have a notebook with me at all times. And I still have notes where I'm like, mechanical owl. <laughs> that meant something to me in Chicago in 2018, but I have no idea what. So it's a lot of... <laughs> I, I also tell uh, people who ask me this to read a lot. I think yeah. that oh, yeah. reading all kinds of stuff, even stuff you think you might not like, because then you start to see how stories work and what works well, what doesn't work well, what kind of characters you like, what kind of stories you like, and that will make your writing stronger and give you inspiration for writing. Do you guys have other questions out here? Yes, again. <laughs> Do you have a notebook right now? I use my phone. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> um, Brandon. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> there was in here, though. 
this has been this is yes. Do you guys all keep journals? I'm not very good at like keeping it. Like I um what I do have that I actually think is really helpful is I call it like a writing log and it's my like it's my venting space and it's on my computer because I do all my writing most like I pretty much do all my writing and like typing now so it's just switching to another document in Word um, and it usually happens when I'm stuck and it's where I go to complain about the book. <laughs> And so hopefully no one will ever read it because um, it's, it's me being like, oh my God, Turtle is driving me crazy. He is the worst dragon. And why am I writing about him? He doesn't deserve his own book because he's being so annoying right now. <laughs> and, like, and I can't solve this problem because he just wants to go like hide under a rock. And uh, oh, I know what I should do. I should bring in Kinkajou. She'll tell him what to do. She'll make him get up and like save the world. So it's like a lot of that. And then, you know, and a lot of it is like also, I will say like every, every book, there's a point at which I'm like, oh, this is the bad one. Everyone's going to hate this one. <laughs> And so the, um, the writing log helps me kind of get past that, like, worry. And I think for sure with, like, any script I write, there's, there's always a point at which I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> like, oh, this is terrible. This was a terrible idea. Oh, yeah, that's inevitable. But I want to tell, can I tell a story, a Tui story from college? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, <yeah. laughs> so uh, Tui and I were friends, and, and one day she was telling me about, about her dreams. And uh, she told me that she dreams in text, like she reads what's happening and then turns the page to find out what happens next in her dreams. <laughs> so wow. it goes deep into his veins. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in screenplays a lot in my... It, yeah, and I'm trying to figure out like what's the third act structure? What should, what should I expect? I don't even remember what I dream. That's amazing. Oh, I did once have a dream where I thought it ended badly, and I was like, that was badly done. You gotta <laughs> like, rewrite that, that could dream. Have been a way better ending. We're plotting. Page one rewrite. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, do we have any other questions lurking out here? Really? Oh, yes, Abby. Um, as observers of human character and human stories, and people who magnify the stories that others are telling, do you have hope? What are you seeing? Like, what can we hold on to in terms of the human spirit as it you know, grows into our now. Oh my God, Jen. Okay, so wait, let me just say that, say that for, let me see if I can get that right. As observers of, of human stories and character, do you have hope for what, the world? Okay, <laughs> the world. <laughs> I mean, I do because I get to hang out with a lot of Zoomers, a lot of Gen Zers, like the kids, my kids' age, um, and they're the best. They're the best generation. They're just, they're so cool. They're so smart and engaged, and they care so much. Like, I, I mean, it helps too that like I'm sitting at a at a table and children are like, I love books, and I'm like, oh, okay, then the world will be fine. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> so I mean a lot of those kids particularly, but I just I think they're. I, I mean, I think, they're, I think they're better than we are. Like, I just think they're such a lovely generation. They, um, my kids' friends are all, um, they, they, I hear them talking to each other about like political issues. They're all like very supportive of their LGBTQ friends. Like, they're just really open-minded. And, um, and I, you know, I don't want to be like, so the kids will come save us all. But like- Sorry about all the problems we gave you. <laughs> no, catch. <laughs> but also I gave you some dragons. Does that help? <laughs> So, but that's where I find hope, like, is just knowing, like, just how awesome, like, those kids are, and, like, that, um, that, that they, they're, they still have hope, right? Like, that, yeah, I think that, I don't know, I think they're, like, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty cool. Anyway. I don't know, I, I feel differently. Oh, no! <laughs> and this is against no one's children here. Um, I just, I just worry about the focus on, on, on STEM, which is obviously essential, but we've moved so far away from, from English and language and arts and like, uh, I, um, you know, screen time. And my brother and I, we would just be set loose outside. And I think as many of us were around class of 98. Yeah. <laughs> and you just went and roamed and you created things and we built things. and. By the end of the day, we like made a movie with the neighbors and also built a fort. And I feel like there was so much more hands-on creativity and, and um, you were forced to use your imagination. Whereas now you just pull up a screen and if it's not that one that you want, it's another one. And so, um, you know, I see it with my own niece and nephew who are wildly creative. 
but if a screen is an option, that's, that's what they're going for. Um, and I say this as someone who makes movies, so obviously I like screens. Part of the problem. <laughs> but I don't know, it's, 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 it's interesting. I, I think it's a very interesting time, and I'm really glad that we graduated when we did, because I can't even imagine trying to navigate this with, mm -hmm. with social media and, and, and all of the pressures of that. So um, I'm glad I was a nerd prior to social media. <laughs> Yeah, we have one more question okay. over there here. There were no smartphones when we were in college. Okay. Wait, can I right. jump onto that one more yeah. time? Because what you, so come to my, one of my events, because the kids who line up with, <laughs> to talk about dragons are like, here's all my art that I have drawn of dragons. Here are the stories that I've written set in this world, like the fan fiction community. So the, there's some of them out there, like making real creative stuff. And I, that's, what, that's what, yeah, right? All right, we can take one more question. I know you had your hand up, and then we're getting kicked out of here. Actually, two very short questions. Uh -oh. <laughs> now, Vicky, you said you and Tui were friends. <laughs> Time for some gossip. No, <laughs> we can't talk about that here. <laughs> uh, Reed, you probably prompted this question, but it may apply to everyone in, in various ways. You said that when you go somewhere and do a documentary, you're not really necessarily helping that group of people. Could that be something that documentarians can do someday? Is there a, a schema that, that we don't have right now that will allow? that sort of you know, thing to turn into help? Uh, have you ever imagined like, what that would look like? And you know, for the rest of you, I, mean, I think that your, your work is not quite as directly among the people. Who, you, know, you, you write books and you affect people, but you know, Vicki, your kids are gonna be applying to things in 18 years, uh, whereas you're right among those people. Is, is there some way that, that you can imagine that that would be different? Well, I, I think a lot of document documentary Documentary filmmakers do help, you know. By there are a lot of really powerful documentaries that that have have huge impacts and positive impacts in the world. But I, I was speaking more in the context of like coming from a uh, North America or Europe into into a global South con country, and and often often it it, it doesn't help. Or, or there's that you know, the, uh, or maybe I'm not the one who's supposed to be telling that story. You know, maybe it's someone in that country who's supposed to be telling that story, and uh, and maybe that. Uh, yeah, but I, and I think that part of it, a conflict, is that sometimes you feel like you can help. The story needs to be told. Nobody's doing it, so I, sh I should tell it. But at the same time, there may be, uh, that, that may be problematic, uh, you know, sort of parachuting in and, and doing that. I think that's also kind of a complicated setup in that if you're a documentarian, you want to be there presenting and representing the truth and not your own spin on it in that you, like, now this is going to be used to save these people or... I mean, jump in if you want, but like, just seems like that, that's a tricky, that seems like a tricky spot. Yeah, for sure. And in fact, you know, in, in Cuba, I actually, I try to stay very focused uh, on, on how the U.S. is impacting Cuba, mm -hmm. because I feel like that's my responsibility. I'm from the U.S. I don't, I, I don't focus, sometimes I get criticized, well, why aren't you talking about uh, human rights abuses in Cuba and problems in Cuba? I say, well, that's not actually my issue. And there's, the U.S. is doing plenty in Cuba for me to focus on, so that's where I need to, to, to stay focused. Um, I really want to thank all of you for coming, everyone for being here, and to Williams for thinking about highlighting these people and the, kind of all of their choices. Also, if you love something, if you support it, if you think artists should have the chance to be vibrant and create, pay, pay for it. Yeah. Buy a newspaper, buy a book, support independent film.